Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live November 13th, 2019. I'm going to talk about a scam. I got scammed. I've got a solution for the Mavic Mini. You say it doesn't have 4K? Oh, yes. Talk about yes, it does. Yeah. And um, I've got a big box to open. I found a perfect camera for Steve. Those are totally unrelated, as you will see very shortly. And as usual, I'm very glad to welcome back my good friend and co-host, Steve Skirts. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys out there? How are you, Toby? I'm doing well, thank you. And yep, you said hi to the chat room, chat, those folks who have joined us live. Thank you so much. We love your comments and questions. And I know we're using StreamYard, which, you know, a couple of weeks ago I saw, um, I could put up your comments on the screen. I can give you 15 seconds of incredibly mild fame. So <laughs> if you have a pithy comment about something we're talking about, put it in those comments. If you're watching this non-live, what's non-live? Recorded version. Yes. Throw something in the comments. I love to see your comments. Uh, and uh, I respond to as many of them as I can. And just a note, all of our show notes, what we're pulling from, what I'm talking about, what Steve and I are thinking about and sharing with you all, that is linked right down below this video. So you can find that information there if you want more about anything that we happen to be talking about. Um, so jump right in. Uh, we're going to get to the I Got Scammed. We're going to get to the Mavic Mini pretty early on in the show, but just a couple of things we want to cover. First, want to make sure people know this show is brought to you by Squarespace. You can save 10% off your first website, domain, gallery, storefront, blog. You know, you want to make a page dedicated to your grandmother's 99th birthday. You can do that at Squarespace. And the really cool thing is actually, if you just make it like a week before her birthday, you don't even have to give them your credit card information and you can have the web page up for a week for free. And then once her birthday, you're like, grandma, here you go. Look at this wonderful web page I made you. And oh, is she ever going to look at it again? No, but the gift you, that does not keep on giving. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't in that case, but it is really nice of Squarespace to do that. There's no gotchas there. And so you can try it out. You can try it out again and again and again, use different emails, figure out what you want to do. And then when you're happy, you give them their credit card information, use photorec, what is it? squarespace.com slash photorec TV. You'll save 10% off when you do that. I've moved my entire site over to Squarespace now, and I've been very, very happy. I still get the security emails from the WordPress folks. Today, I got one that said this, you know, these three plugins you have need to be updated immediately. I cannot tell you how many plugins I used to have to run. How many plugins do I run now on Squarespace? <laughs> that many. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, a couple of other things that I want to share with you. One is I still have a little bit of room on the midweek Zion National Park trip. That is almost a year from now, a little bit less. Uh, you can find a link to that if you want more information. The highlight of that tour, it's a short tour. The highlight being our exploration of the Narrows. Kevin Walk just did the Narrows uh, last weekend. We're going to be looking at a few of his pictures in our Lightroom Tips and Tricks section. It is an amazing, gorgeous, beautiful place, and it's an awesome adventure. To me, that is like one of the best experiences out there where you get to go and have this really cool adventure, but also walk away with fantastic pictures that people are going to look at and be like, what? Is that even real? So uh, you can look for that link right down below. Um, we mentioned the Bodhi tour last weekend or last uh, show. Um, both of those sold out within 20 minutes. Wow. So um, there was a lot of interest in that. That's photographing the old ghost town, uh, the one of the best preserved ghost towns in America. Um, it's in California. I'm really excited. That will be next, uh, what is it? Late May, early June, if I'm uh, late May, late May for those. Yeah, I'm always bummed. Those the, that's the trip that I I uh, have not been on with you guys ever. I've never been to Joshua Tree, and now you're doing Bodie, and um, obviously I'm, I'm and I'm not going to make that one either because it always falls at my anniversary. And um, yeah, I mean, come on, one anniversary, two anniversaries. If you're around for like three in a row, don't you get a free one? <laughs> no, well, I know. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and a new thing that I've been adding in to the show notes right up at the beginning is, is there any interesting deals of the day that I've come across? And we'll be talking a little bit more about this, Steve. I'm really interested to get your opinion. 
we have the new MacBooks that were just announced today. They've been leaked and talked about for a while, but we've got the full details, full pricing, 16 inch MacBook Pro. Have you pre-ordered yours yet, Steve? <laughs> I haven't because I'm really hoping that they come out with a 14 inch that replaces the 13.3 inch, you know, in the mm -hmm. same footprint. Um, but if they do that same type of thing, but come out with a 14 inch, I think that would just be awesome. Um, I'm looking more for something super light, more like the MacBook Air, or I really like the the standard MacBook, but I guess that's gone away. So something, you know, may, maybe like an updated MacBook Air, but um, that new Pro. So here's the cool thing about the Pro is they've addressed all the issues that people seem to be having. We'll tell it'll tell over time if it's a success, but. They did away with that uh, butterfly keyboard. Mm -hmm. and they've gone back to more of a scissor keyboard like, you know, they used to have. Um, they've got their own, um, what, escape button that's taken off of the trackpad. They, it's got its own uh, fingerprint reader as a power button. And uh, supposedly the speakers in it are just awesome. And you can order that thing with up to eight terabytes SSD. That's what I'm showing right now. So I was trying to find some more interesting video of it, but yes, here. So this 6,099 price gets you an eight terabyte SSD. That's so insane. That is, a, that is a lot of money any way you slice it for, for a laptop computer. No question about it. However, what the new Mac, Mac Pro that's coming out, I think that thing maxes out at like eight terabytes SSD, or mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you can load a lot more than that. I could be uh, just guessing here, but you know, that's, that's a lot of space. I mm -hmm. paid, I think I paid 4,000 or 4,500 for my MacBook pro years ago, late 2013 with one terabyte of SSD. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, that's a lot of money, but that's eight terabytes. That's a lot of space. That's a lot of space and it's powerful. It's 64 megs of, sorry, 64 gigabytes of RAM um, and it's an i9 processor. It, it's it's impressive specs, but that is a crazy, crazy high price for a laptop. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. If, I, mean, I, I wouldn't order something that high anyway. I'm doing mostly everything with external storage now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. it's kinda, you know, that's, that's more for just the, almost like a desktop replacement for a, uh, you know, professional in a studio or something that's really needs yeah. space. I mean, if they gave me one for free, I certainly wouldn't mind carrying it around the house. <laughs> carrying it around the house. <laughs> but I don't, I don't see myself hitting the road with that anytime soon. That's that's going in the opposite direction from what I've kind of been looking yeah. for and hoping for. I like your idea of you know, kind of taking that same space that they have for the 13 inch, squeezing in a little bit of a bigger screen, similar to what they did with the 16. So, I mean, the 16 really isn't bigger than my old, our old 15s. Is that correct? Uh, it's the same. Yeah. Same footprint. I think it's, um, it's a tiny bit thicker and a little bit heavier, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the screen, the size of it is exactly the same. They've just increased the, uh, the screen on the, um, yeah. on the bezel. So, All right. Yeah, it's uh, that's a beast, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see which way that they, they go. I, um, you know, I was supposed to get in a really nice lightweight ThinkPad that's just been held up in shipping. Um, so I need to circle back with those guys because uh, I really like. I, there was an article the other day that caught my eye. We're going all over the place here, but it just said something about the productivity level of office employees with Windows versus Macs. And uh, it seems pretty unbiased. This seemed like a fairly scientific article. I just read the summary though. So there might've been some other gems in there that I'm missing. Um, but it basically said Mac people are more productive. Mm -hmm. And you know that synced nicely with one of my friends the other day, I follow her on Instagram and her Instagram story was waiting for her uh, Windows PC to update. And it was just, you know, this is that classic updating, updating, updating forever. And here we both have what, four going on almost five-year-old laptops that just really have worked really well. So there is a premium here, but I feel like over time that premium pays off in longevity. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you've heard me say this before on the show. I just replaced my desktop in 2017, late 2017. And the desktop that I replaced was a 2006 iMac. Yeah. That's, so, cool. that's a 11 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's just crazy. I mean, don't get me wrong. It really needed to be replaced. 
<laughs> but it still worked fine. You know, yeah. it maxed out the memory and, um, you know, I just outgrew it. But if you stripped it all out, in fact, we gave it to my stepson. He'd been using it. And as far as I know, he's still using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sue Stevenson, I see you asking my Zion trip had a space. I thought I sold it out. So there's two. I have two Zion trips. The weekend one is sold out. There's a midweek one uh, that I believe at least has two, maybe even three spaces still available to it. So there's a link to that right down below in the show notes. Follow that. And chat room, we said hi to you, but we also want to recognize that many of you are Photo Enthusiast Network members. Thank you so much for your membership. Uh, we are really excited about what we are building and working on to bring you hopefully quite soon within the next well, let's say 30 to 90 days that's a nice you know range because you never know exactly how long a transition like this is going to take you but our our hope and our goal and though it seems to be coming to fruition is just a much better education site that really supports your learning. Super, super proud of all of the content we have in there. But honestly, the platform it's currently on hasn't been the most search friendly. It hasn't been the most user friendly. And so we really want to take uh, some time and showcase that. And uh, just excited. And, I, and in the new year, I'll be launching my completely revamped Lightroom education series as well, both from a long video form that shows you everything you need to do from installing Lightroom all the way up um, and short form videos as well. So you looking for, let me just get some tips and tricks on using the radial filter tool. And I pour my heart and soul into these short little videos as well. They give you just what you need to know in kind of a quick digestible format. So if you're interested in joining, you can do so at photorec.tv slash pen um, or just go to photoenthusiastnetwork.com. So stay yeah. tuned for that. That's that's just going to be awesome uh, and and much needed in my opinion. Not that the old site. I mean, it's only a couple of years old, but uh, you launch a company and then over the course of a couple of years, you start to figure out exactly how you use the platform, how members are using the platform, what you want to do with it. And we've discovered over the last couple of years that there's certain limitations that we've been running up against. And so um, I'm really excited to see uh, kind of what gets rolled out. I've, I've had kind of a, a taste of what's in the works and it's really, really exciting. It's going to be super cool. So tell your friends about that. Um, you guys will see everything as it is until the switchover happens. Um, but you know, so there's still just tons of great content. And um, a lot of times we talk about this as a pen community. Uh, a lot of times there's questions that come up on the Facebook page and stuff, and that's great. But there's also a lot of really great tutorials in there. I know they can be a little difficult to find at times, but we have put them into sections. And I do encourage you to kind of play around in there, just get familiar with it so it's not too daunting whenever you log in, if you haven't logged in in a long time. There's a lot of great material in there. There really is. It really is. And I, um, I'm just super proud of all of it. Uh, my most recent uh, Tuesday tip, which was written and video form, you know, one of the common things that happened, if you don't have that new MacBook with eight terabytes of space, <laughs> you probably need to clear out space from time to time. And I show you uh, tips and tricks for on Mac and Windows for going through, especially in Lightroom, figuring out what's taking up space, getting rid of that. And then outside of Lightroom using programs that show you, oh, maybe there's this program you installed, or maybe there's this game your son installed, for instance, um, that's taking up nine gigs of space on your hard drive when you've been- experience there, bud? Yeah, a lot, just, I speak from a little experience. Um, I, I did give him permission to do that. I shouldn't throw him completely under the bus and I actually enjoy playing it too. So, you know, uh, <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to the part of the show that we, we love so much. And that is to, uh, pen members, you have submitted photos to us. We're going to take a few moments, look at them in Lightroom, really give you tips and tricks, both Lightroom. And sometimes we jump over to Photoshop as well, because uh, that's an integral part of the whole process. Um, and if you would like to be able to submit pictures to us, become a pen member. It is just one of very many benefits you get all at a very reasonable rate. So I'm going to stick my screen back in here. And I do remember this week that we, to remind you that we need to stay on the screen so that we can use our audio. Um, sometime I'll tell you why it all works that way, but you know, that's just how it is. Okay. First up, we've got Chris Bartell. This is the, um, oh gosh, I'm throwing a total blank on the name of this white uh, lighthouse that we've just been to, what, two, three weeks ago. Um, uh, is this Bar Harbor? No, this is just yeah. right there outside of uh, uh, outside of Portland. Portland Head, Portland Head Lighthouse, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, she said two. I think they are the same. Yeah. Okay. So um, they are D and Gs, but I don't see any edits to the sliders. They look like they've been finished. It does. Right. Yeah, that's definitely been edited. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the first thing I kind of notice is that the edit is, a, uh, for my taste, a little bit heavy and really feels like it's definitely been edited. But it has some really nice color and texture to it. I don't know. Steve, what do you think? Well, so uh, Chris Chris has been great about um, submitting, you know, almost every week over the past few weeks. And I, I really enjoy the way that she edits her, her photos um, because, you know, she's done some good work with Photoshop. I remember that um, Native American guy where she changed the background now was really cool. Um, and one of the things I like about the way that she typically edits is it looks uh, well presented, but it doesn't look overdone. And I, I think you kind of said it earlier, Toby, this looks just slightly overdone, a little too crunchy on the edges, um, a little too much vibrancy. And um, I mean, it's, it's done really well, uh, but I think it's just slightly overdone. It, 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 there's this fine line between realistic and making something pop and really uh, get your attention and then going just slightly too far. Now, there are cases where you purposely go way too far. You create something just totally surreal and artsy out of an image, and that's done on purpose. And, and you can tell that the artist is you know, expressing themselves in that way. Um, but I think if you tone this back just a little bit, that would be great. The other thing is uh, that rock edge on the right-hand side gets clipped off because of the mm -hmm. vertical orientation of the photograph. Um, it's not that big of a deal because you see the whole rock so you can imagine, but you don't know as a viewer who's never been there, you don't know where that goes. You don't know if that's just rock land that continues on and on and on, or if it ends shortly after that little uh, house to the right of the lighthouse. Um, you're just kind of left in this, this mystery and it can be just a little stressful to the eye. So I would do like you're doing there. I would, I would come in. Um, a bit tighter and just, yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe somewhere around there as well. You could include a little bit. But it is, it is just that hint of the fact that they're just as it starts to drop off here that really kind of teases you more. Um, and, you know, I think this is a great uh, example. This really illustrates nicely how, um, you know, parts of it should look like they've been over edited but you look at the house i feel like the house uh looks beautiful the lighthouse itself i think the sky is pretty nice it really is kind of the clouds and the or sorry the rocks here in the foreground and the water so this really points to being very selective in your edits i think can really go a long way if you had just kind of applied that extra bit of clarity and vibrance to um, the buildings and, and dialed it back a little bit on the rocks and the water um, you'd be in great shape yeah nice. and i think if you uh if you dial down the clarity in the clouds, you know, smooth out the clouds just a little bit. It's cool. There's some great texture in there, but just to smooth it out a bit because you have so much clarity in the structure and the rocky foreground and even the little waves coming into that, um, that bay right there. There's so much detail in all of that that you get up into the clouds and it's almost like, okay, my eye has seen enough, you know, crunchy detail. You want to see just you know, kind of soft clouds as a backdrop to these harsher elements and then, you know, contrasting the the clearer stuff in the foreground. I just think it, it balances out a little bit more. Yeah, I, I agree. I threw a graduated filter over the sky, brought texture and clarity down a little bit and then just used the brush to erase it back off our house. And I think that's a nice improvement. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's go. Chris is uh, sorry, Steve. No, I was just saying that was awesome. Great okay. show. Uh, Chris has got another one, uh, another angle of the same lighthouse. Cool. I love this angle. It's so awesome looking. It's really nice. Yeah. 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 Um, I, don't... I would love to have this raw file to play around with on my own desktop to kind of toy with the uh, transform tool and mm. work on some angles a little bit. I like what she's done with it. The, what you start to see though here, if you guys can notice this, especially because you have this 
it's like an uh, exterior electrical line that's running up the structure just to the right of that window. If you kind of follow that, it the structure, obviously it goes from wide to narrow at the top, but it almost bends outward, right? Like a, as you mm -hmm. get into the different texture on the top third of the lighthouse, it starts to lay down flat. So I would, you know, go in with the transform tool and maybe pick it up just a little bit kind of straighten it out so it doesn't feel like it's bent outwards and it looks just more straight and you know kind of rising into the sky it's a really cool angle and this is where i love when you get under these structures with a wide angle and stuff it just kind of exaggerates everything yeah yeah very um, cool yeah, yeah I, I think it's it's neat you know i this is a nice shot i have similar ones i'm very happy with them um but it's also kind of an iconic shot and then you move on to something like this and it's different you don't see many photos of lighthouses shot from such a close angle um like that and it presents a different and the sky is beautiful in this case too now i i i know it's there so some people may um take issue with this but i would actually spend time in photoshop and probably remove that uh, that exterior electrical line that's that's uh, mm. running the course because once you notice it your eye just keeps going there and it and it drives me a little nutty I, I just kind of take that out and keep it nice and clean yeah yeah all right a nice job uh chris let's move on to kevin as i mentioned he just recently did the narrows hike it is a gorgeous gorgeous spot and so we've got two shots from him to talk about for a moment wow that's that's quite a location that yeah. So I'm actually, this is a six second shutter speed. I'm actually a little surprised at the amount of texture that is in the water. We have just these little bits of trails and stuff in here. Mm -hmm. um, I would have thought that they would have smoothed out a little bit more. But, you know, I, first thing I want to do is go into the crop tool um, because similar to um, kind of that hinting in our uh, lighthouse picture, I feel like we've got this hinting of a different world over here on the left um, right. in, in a way that's more distracting than anything. I think the bulk of this shot is look at these amazing sandstone canyons. And so I'm going to kind of adjust this so that that is really pretty much all of the story. What do you think? We could yeah. make our, what do you think? Arguments about yeah. keeping in this little curve? I would even, no, I would take that out because that's just the start of a story that ends abruptly. So um, yeah, I come in a bit tighter, you know, and, and our eye is naturally gonna go to the things in focus, especially in the areas that are soft or out of focus. And um, it was, yeah, that looks much better. And, and it looks so much more grand. It feels like you're actually kind of standing in the water now instead of out on a shoreline kind of watching things. Because there was so much blur at the bottom of the frame before. And then that stuff over on the left-hand side didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. So now it really makes you feel like you're just kind of standing right there in the water. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing the highlights down just a little because I felt like it was a little bright in through this stretch here. Um, but otherwise, maybe the shadows up just to high, show a little bit more back there. But otherwise, I think that's nice. Kevin, one of the things that I like and we encourage often on our workshops is you got down low. You're presenting a perspective that looks a bit different than what we normally see when we're walking around at our five feet, six feet kind of range. Um, and I think that helps uh, the image as well. I'm, I'm just looking at the bottom here. I might bring it in just a tiny bit more, just a bit. And I might, again, take my brush, uh, well, in this case, just take my brush and, uh, again, texture, clarity, and blew it up a little um, and then go over the water here, just kind of the water, just to further smooth it out. I think it's getting too blue. I'll back that back off. But just to kind of further um, smooth the water and emphasize the water smoothness versus the texture of the rocks. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, it looks good. I, I like that a lot. And I love how some of the lines, you know, like over on that top right, how the, the rock kind of jets out up towards that corner, but it doesn't quite hit the corner. You know, it, it still leaves some space up there. Yeah, yeah, nice. And another one um, with some pretty amazing light. Who, this is Kevin's also? This is Kevin's also from In the Narrows, yep. Oh man, that that light is awesome. 
Kevin, I want to know, um, not necessarily related to this picture, though, it makes me think of it because I see smoother, deeper water there. What was the deepest water that you waded through when you went through, Kevin? I'm curious. Let us know in the chat. Um, this is, this is, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'd raise shadows a little bit, but what do you guys, what do you think, Steve? I, I'm a little concerned about the rocky side on the left. It's, um, it, it, it looks I don't know if it looks noisy or blotchy or um, just over over processed. It's it's hard for me to tell on my screen here. Yeah, I think I think some of that is internet issues there. But let me see if I can just kind of I threw a, a graduated filter over it. I warmed it up a little bit and um, or sorry, I just um, brightened it a little bit and zooming in. I mean, it's a little noisy there in the shadows. Also, it looks like, Kevin, you might have did. I mean, that looks um, like you may have done a little Photoshop work there and healed something. I don't know if that was what you were seeing, too, Steve. But um, it looks it looks pretty clean to me. OK, yeah, it, it's it's hard for me to tell because I'm just, you know, I'm looking at a smaller version of your screen yeah. by the time it gets to me. But um, I just I love the way the light is coming through and hitting those trees and, and the color. I would probably. Um, I would personally dull down the saturation uh, of the rocks, especially on the left-hand side, you know, just a little bit. And then I would increase the vibrance and saturation of the colorful trees that the sun is hitting because that's where your eye is going and just really make that pop a little bit. And I think if you dull down the left side, it'll just make that center part um, stand out even more. You want to just, and with a shot like this, where the sun is just really directly coming in and it's it's so apparent where you want the viewer to go, you don't want to apologize for that. You want to almost, almost exaggerate it a little bit. I know a lot of times I talk about salt on food and, you know, going too far will spoil the dish, which it will. But there are some cases where you can, you know, like when we do our fall colors tours, the way that I'm seeing the leaves is extremely vibrant in my mind's eye. And then I get the picture, the raw file, and it just looks bland. So yeah. I tend to crank those up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I threw a uh, graduated filter inverted over top of the tree, uh, warmed it up, increased the saturation, increased the exposure a touch and the highlights a touch. And I think that's a great uh, tip. Let's do a quick, um, here's original and after. Yeah. No. I, I, no. I don't know. Maybe darken that uh, that left side down uh, a bit. Yeah, I might have I might have overdone that in the center, though. Yeah. So we'll just back that down a little bit more. Yeah. Nice. And Kevin answered. Uh, he feels uh, about waist deep. He's five foot eleven and waist deep was how deep he had to go. Gotcha. All and, part uh, of fun uh, adventure. Kyle's got a great comment in there. He says, how is it looking black and white? Um, hmm. toggle that over real quick. I, I bet this would be a cool black and white. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. It's very nice. Good suggestion, Kyle. Um, I, it almost looks infrared. The light is so bright on those trees. It's mm -hmm. so cool. You could, you could really do some cool work as a black and white with this one. Yeah. And I would and probably come up from the bottom a bit, really bring the viewer right into that center section as, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, uh, the couple uh, keyboard shortcuts I love, if you're not using R to get into that crop tool, A to unlock the little lock aspect ratio. So then you can do whatever uh, aspect you want. I do like that there's a person in here for scale. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I, just... um, I guess that I don't know if it's a what they're carrying here, something dark there. I wish that wasn't there because it feels like a dog or something and dogs aren't allowed in there. So that keeps distracting me. But the person is nice because it does give just kind of a better sense of this epic grandness inside here. It's probably a Pokemon doll. Probably. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, I meant to. OK, so uh, I think black and white is awesome. Uh, some of that color was competing for attention. Um, yeah, I do know. like it better as a black and white. Yeah. Uh, great suggestion to, to Kyle. Yeah, I think you can go you can go either way there. So um, let's remove that from the stream. So we're back to this stuff. And let's uh, give Kyle his a moment of fame. Uh, I did want to say I, in the opening, 
you know, we are competing today with like the first full day that Disney Plus has been actually running and the impeachment trial stuff. So if you're watching this live, thank you for taking a break from either binging The Mandalorian or binging uh, Schiff and all the impeachment trial. Depends on, you know, which which camp I've you're in. I've The Mandalorian episode twice. I can't wait for episode two. Oh, are they? Re I wasn't sure. I watched about 15 minutes of the first, um, and uh, I, I thought it was very good so far. Very well done. Great special effects. Oh, and it's awesome. It's yeah. so great. Uh, I jumped on that. Well, I'm a Disney fan, but I jumped on that. You know, you pay for three years in advance. You get a really special deal a while ago. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I've been really excited about the launch of Disney Plus, and it, it hasn't disappointed so I haven't really had crashing issues and um, – I don't know. For people that like Disney stuff, um, you know, Marvel and Nat Geo and all that stuff, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. But Mandalorian is, I mean, it's great. Yeah. Um, if you're a vis if you're a Verizon subscriber on one of their ultimate plans, you get a free year. Go log into Verizon and there'll be a little ad for it. You click on it, you get the code, and then you go over to Disney Plus and sign in. It's pretty uh -huh. cool. So that's that's how I did it because I wasn't. I was like, I don't want to sign up for another subscription when I got right. these other ones. <laughs> that's what uh, I, it was only. It was only available for a couple of days. Um, I had heard about it on a YouTube video or something, and so I did. You had to go through all these hoops, and you get this coupon code or whatever, and then you had to wait twenty four hours, and you finally were able to do it. But it equates to like three bucks a month. It's so cheap. Yeah, that's not bad. That's yeah, not bad. And I'm just tired of paying, you know, monthly stuff. All right, Steve, I'm going to give you the option. What do you want to hear about next? Do you want to hear about how I was scammed or how you can get 4K 60 frames per second on the Mavic Mini? Oh, how you were scammed. Okay. Okay. I'm so earlier earlier today, <laughs> earlier today, I got this email. Hello, are you available in December between the 7th or the 14th for dates uh, to cover five hours of photo coverage? Uh, and provide six 16 by 20 canvas family prints. We've got six families coming together for a reunion event and a total of 70 guests. I got your information on the internet and I hope you can handle this event. I'll be looking forward to read from you the estimate cost. That so, sounds pretty legit. I mean, I, I, get, a lot of, uh, I get a lot of uh, sketchy jobs and stuff thrown my way, emails and phone calls and stuff. But that one sounds pretty legit. Yeah, it did. Um, the things that were the key. So, you know, I didn't actually get scammed. I saw this and I was like, I think this is one of those scams. They go around every once in a while in the wedding groups. I see this. Um, and uh, the other thing that was interesting is where are you located? Are, are you supposed to figure out first what photographers are in the area where you're having a reunion, not say where are you located? Mm -hmm. Also, the reason why it helped me to know this was a scam is because I have no information out there anymore that says, hey, I'm available for portrait photography and family photography. Oh, it's, that's, yeah. It's just not a thing. So, but I said, you know, I said, sure, I got a show later today. Uh, we got to fill the time somehow. Why don't I write this lady back? And I said, hi, Sandra. I'm available on those dates for a variety of holiday style photo shoots because, you know, it's around the holiday time. And I wanted to be all inclusive. I said holiday, not Christmas. I didn't want to make any, you know, assumptions. I can provide five hours of photo coverage for $1,200 and the canvas prints will cost $80 each. She says, uh, uh, I'm okay with the cost. It meets my budget. Oh yeah. And she wrote me back right away too. And I'm willing to make payment via credit card. So you get the date fixed and prepared for the event. Would you prefer sending me an electronic invoice or should I forward you my credit card details? And, you know, I'm not sending this lady anything official from my business. So I said, go ahead and forward your payment details to me. I'll take care of that and send you a contract. Again, trying to look a little serious. And there was a part of me that said, uh, I hope this isn't actually somebody who really needs photo and I'm just messing with them. <laughs> thing. So. Um, the internet though. So. so, but then here it comes. She writes back and says, okay, but I will need a favor from you. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, why don't you just say the favor in the email, Sandra? Why do you have to say, right, I have to now write you and say, okay, Sandra, what's the favor? I have yet to pay the event planner uh -huh. and I owe them 3,500. And then I'm gonna, uh, you know, please put that in the charge to me, the 3,500 plus a credit card fee, plus $200 tip for your stress. I said, okay, I need 5% on top for the extra trouble. She said, that's fine. Send me the electronic invoice so I can make a payment.
So, and then I, I haven't written her back. What happens next? I send an electronic uh, payment and I mean, an electronic invoice and, and what? They hack my PayPal or I mean, how does it work? I know um, that's the thing. Sometimes these scams, I sit back and I go, well, what is the angle? Like, what are you, what are you trying to get? And it can be as simple as just information. Mm -hmm. you know, responding to a text or a phone call or something like that. And then all of a sudden you've opted into something. Yeah. Um, so later on today, after the show and all my oodles of spare time, I'm going to get out some of the kids crayons and I'm going to draw up a really nice, colorful invoice, uh, scan <laughs> it, send it to her and see what happens next. <laughs> Stay tuned. Come back next week to find out. That's awesome. Uh... So Brian says classic phishing scam. I know, but I don't understand. At some point, it's probably going to be like, oh, but here, wire me money at Western Union. And then, you know, yeah. that's the thing. The last time I've tried to sell gear online, eBay and Amazon both, it was a pain in the butt because the number of messages that were like, I'm really interested. And then you'd be like, okay. And then they'd be like, but I'm overseas. And I'd be like, okay, I can make that work but I need to use Western Union. Right. Okay. I'll send my courier with a trailer and I don't have a problem with your price. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I gave up, I, I sold a motorcycle, uh, I don't know, a year and a half, a couple years ago and uh, ended up selling it on Cycle Trader and I paid for like the premium listing and stuff. But even through Cycle Trader, I had to filter through all kinds of junk to find a guy that finally bought it and, and he was great. But uh, I also put the ad out on Craigslist and it was a mm. nightmare. It was yeah. an absolute nightmare, the amount of junk that I got. There wasn't a single legit response to the, to the ad. No, yeah. that's a shame. It's just a waste of so much time. I used to use yeah. Craigslist all the time when I lived in San Francisco. It was, I did a lot of business on there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, not that kind of business. <laughs> I was buying and selling mid-century modern furniture. Uh, Brian actually has a, a great suggestion of write back and say, I'll do it for free for the exposure because the exposure will be good. I like that too. Uh, what would she, what she do then? Yeah. Oh, no, no, sir, I must pay you. No, I refuse all payment. I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart. Yeah. Gosh, I got I, uh, that, that gives me a good suggestion. Well, I'll have to decide. Crayon, crayon and colorful invoice, or I'll do it for free. We'll see. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Mavic Mini. Let's talk seriously about it before we talk about 4K at 60, which I'm actually kind of serious about as well. Um, Mavic Mini, it arrived yesterday. I've been flying it uh, pretty close to nonstop. You can't quite believe how light it is. Even it is just ridiculously light. Uh, and so I'm impressed. And I took it out this, um, I took it out around. It's tiny. It really is. It really is. And it folds up very small as well, exactly like the Mavic Pro models. What's, that, uh, uh, what's that, that growth you have on the top of it? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Just hold on, okay? <laughs> um, uh, let, me, let me pull over. If you want to see my uh, quick thoughts and my pros and cons I've come up with for this drone already, again, linked in the show notes. Go to the show notes, and then in there is the link to the draft of the document that I'm working on for my full review. Here's what I want to say. If you've never owned a drone, fantastic first drone. I mean, $399, super easy to fly. We'll get hit that in my pros. If you're looking for an incredible, tiny, and easy-to-use selfie stick, this drone is fantastic. I mean, if you want a selfie stick longer than the six feet of what most of us are carrying around a selfie stick for, this is fantastic, obviously a lot more. If you're looking to create lots of amazing drone cinematography, uh, you should pay more. Uh, and I'll get to why in a second. So um, let's start with the pros. Super lightweight and incredibly compact when it's all folded up. Uh, it does USB charging. So right now, I have a USB battery, just because just I can. This was in my backpack while I rode my bike down to the park. Um, so you can charge the battery pack. There's two batteries in here right now from a USB battery. I could also plug this directly into the Mavic Mini and be charging it as well. Uh, that's pretty snazzy, I like that. Um, it is incredibly stable platform. It was windy today. I estimate that it was about 15 miles per hour, gusts a little bit more, enough that I was getting warnings on the screen saying strong winds land immediately. I've now, um, I've now done almost 200 flights with drones over the last couple of years. Uh, I know that 
pretty precisely because I have an app that keeps track of that and uploads it to a website very nicely. Um, and I've gotten that error or that that warning lots and lots of times. I know how much wind it can actually handle. And I was pleasantly surprised with how stable it remained even when it was pretty windy, close to what it says is its maximum wind that you're supposed to fly in, which I think is about 17 miles per hour. It is super easy to fly, which I kind of mentioned in the opening. I mean, the 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 whole interface is much more simple. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's, that's great and, and easy. Um, and it is affordable. $399 gets you the drone plus the battery. And the fact that you can USB charge it, you know, means that you fly for a little bit, pay 45 bucks for one spare extra battery. So you're up to what, 450 ish. Uh, you're in really good shape. That's pretty impressive. And, what's and our fly more pack is a hundred bucks, right? Fly, 499. Yeah. With tax. So the fly more pack, which is what I bought, which gets me this, this charger that charges three batteries at once. Um, plus the props and uh, spare props, the case that it comes in. And of course the controller, um, this case weighs more than the drone itself. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating, uh, is comes with, with the base though, right? I'm sorry, say that the controller comes with the base. Yes, it does. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, what was I going to say? Oh, I with tax 560. So, you know, starting to get a little pricey, but that gets me, everything I need to fly. Um, so that's all the good. Uh, the one more good that I want to mention is payload capacity. So this little wart on top is for me to mount the GoPro. A GoPro is capable of shooting 4K at 60 frames per second. Now, I couldn't do it because the only cage I could find, and there was just a little bit of cussing downstairs here today as I was looking for the plastic version of this, is too heavy. This cage weighs as much as this GoPro. So together, both of them mounted on top. When I try to take off, it goes And I, I tried three times in a row, couldn't do it. But um, I, I'm not obviously not the only guy that had this idea. The guys at UAV, or We Talk UAV, let me share my screen again for you for a second here. Um, they did it. There is, they have the hero eight mounted on there. Um, and it really flies and the footage is gorgeous and super stable because of the electronic stabilization. So yes, your battery life is going to be way shorter. Yes. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but I am saying it is damn impressive that this tiny little drone that weighs nothing can handle a GoPro Hero 8 or 7, I hope it's 7, I think they're the same weight, um, and we'll give you 4K at 60 frames per second if you need that for a short period of time. So you don't, see, uh, you don't see props in the frame from uh, that footage? No, you see how they have it angled up just a little bit. I'm yeah. trying to see where they showed um, a minute of that footage right here, I think. Uh, there it is. Uh, it's not playing super smoothly um, uh, because I think I'm screen recording at the same time. But when you watch this without that, so the, again, these are We Talk UAV guy hosted by Alex, um, and they posted this yesterday. Uh, I, I, lots of people I think are going to. This is not a you know. This is, remember when I had the little Tello, I tried to put the DJI Pocket Osmo on it. Yeah. So um, that clearly wasn't able to hold that much. Plus, I also rubber banded it on there really half ass. So what did I expect? But um, I ordered a new plastic cage off Amazon for 12 bucks. It'll be here tomorrow. I'm going to put it on there, fly it, um, and we'll talk about it in the full review. Again, I'm not recommending that that's what people do. And certainly if you crash and then have to submit your logs to DJI and to try to get the care refresh or whatever, they're going to be like, uh, the way the motors were working, it seems like you were carrying something really heavy. Uh, you're going to avoid all of that. But well, plus you start getting into the cost of, of all that, plus the cost of a GoPro yeah. plus the mounting system. And, uh, you know, you're, you're adding bulk and you're getting 4K, you might as well just buy a Mavic Air at that point, right? Yeah. That shoots 4K, doesn't it? It does shoot 4K. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me get to my cons real quick uh, because there are quite a few. Now, some of them are pretty nitpicky. Um, 
one it's usb it's the micro usb the older style of usb i really wish it was usb c so many different things are usb c these days including my phone and and i always have those cables around plus they just feel more robust to me but it is still the micro usb that you charge with that's a little annoying there's no active track so that really cool feature where it'll track and follow you that the mavic and mavic air has um it's not here you can select a subject for the quick shot modes but beyond that, and there's no move, it won't track you as you move there. Those are just static shots, like it flies away from you and then circles you and stuff like that. No obstacle avoidance. You know, it does look like it's got little cameras up here similar to the Mavic, but they're really just vents or they might even just be stickers. I don't know, nothing. <laughs> um, no 4K, no RAW, no white balance control. Uh, I'm okay without the 4k for this size i'm okay without the raw for this size you get a good jpeg honestly when you shoot you know with this small a sensor this is the same as i've talked about before on my phone you know for a while i was excited that our phones could do raw and then i just realized that the raws just they just aren't that much more exciting than the jpegs to make it worthwhile so you know it's okay the the lack of uh white manual white balance is is an issue because there's a lot of times where if you're sh look, shooting the ground and then you pan up to the sky your white balance is going to change pretty dramatically and sometimes in a way that i find distracting so right. you know it's clear uh, you know i'm nitpicking um but this drone is not marketed at people like me who want that really very carefully controlled cinematic um you know color and style look Quick pictures, quick video, it does a fantastic job. And at that price, it's good. There's no charge indicator on the battery itself. So you either have to put it in the charger or put it in the drone to find out how much juice is in it. And it doesn't use the OcuSync. It uses the Wi-Fi connection mode. Last night I flew it, it was about two, 300 feet away, up above my house, down a little bit. It disconnected and uh, enough that the drone flew back and you know started to land. So good for the drone doing what it's supposed to, bad for disconnecting at such a short distance. And related to that, uh, a couple of times today flying, trying to make more cinematic movements, and you can put it into a cinema mode where the joysticks become a little bit more like sluggish in a good way and your movements are a little bit more thoughtful. It, um, it blips on the screen every once in a while where it just kind of catches the feed and for me, that's really distracting and hard to continue to make a nice circle movement or a pan up movement when it freezes for a moment. And then you don't know if you've lost connection enough that you need to stop what you're doing because you're about to bang into something. So um, that that's really where that exhibits its issue, I think, more than anything. And it seems to drift. I put it up out there for a while. It could have been because it was near its maximum wind speed it was fighting against today, but I let it run for um, about five minutes video. And during that time, it very slowly just turned. It almost looked like it was tracking this tugboat. I'll have all of this video footage in my full review that will be out as soon as possible. Uh, but it just, just slowly turned over the course of the five minutes, very, very slowly. And I've, again, lots of flights with the Mavic Pro original and Mavic Pro 2 um, and Mavic Air to a degree. And I just haven't seen that as an issue. Hmm. So well, they are going to sell a truckload of those things this holiday, though, I'll bet. I really think they are. And I just uh, I want to put in this plug here. Um, this picture I captured with the original Mavic Pro, which is an incredibly similar sensor to what's in the Mini. And, um, you know, Allie and Dave blew that up and it's in their teaching space. I think that's a, what size is that? A 24 by 16 or? Or I think it was a 16 by 24. 16 by 24. Yeah. And it looks gorgeous. So, uh, you know, you can absolutely create stunning images and video with this drone, but you got to go into it with uh, kind of a realistic expectation. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, MJ Adams said, had a guy fly his drone into my shot the other day. What would you do? Shoot uh, it over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it, it kind of depends on how badly it's in the shot. I mean, I, I would, if it's just kind of, a dot in the sky out there somewhere i just clip it out in photoshop and wouldn't really worry about it uh, we have that happen on tours all the time we're you know shooting at a location and then somebody's flying their drone sometimes it's somebody from our tour and it's annoying no question about it i mean just the sound of a drone in the air is kind of annoying to me but I, I agree yeah is is 
can be really, really cool. Um, so I would just Photoshop it out. Now, if, you know, he's flying the drone, it's like right in front of your camera, or you're taking a longer shot and it's just right in, in the line of sight and it's just going to be too big to, to clip out of there, then I, I would say something. Yeah. 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 I think mean, you, you do have to recognize, though, that if he is allowed to fly there, if they are allowed to fly there, then they have just as much right it as you. Um, so as as uh, well, you just pointed out, it was sunrise in a county park that doesn't allow drone. Well, oh, that's a whole other issue then. Yeah. If somebody's flying a drone where they're not supposed to be flying it, whether they're in your shot or not. Uh, I have no problem. In fact, we've said it to people in national parks and stuff, state parks, where uh, it clearly says no flying. And you tell them, hey, man, that's, you know, that's not allowed here. And um, most of the time they're they're kind of just jerks about it and they just keep flying. But um, so be prepared for that. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's uh I could go on forever about etiquette with certain uh, technologies, whether it's cell phones or drones and stuff. And sometimes it just is nails on the chalkboard, isn't it? Am I not alone here? <laughs> no, you're not alone. And you're not alone. And, uh, you know, I, I agree. Uh, you know, we've said things to people because it gives a bad name to people who are, are yeah. flying legally and flying right. And, you know, I just, you know, I really don't like being annoyed. Motorcycles. I've ridden motorcycles my whole life. And, and if I if I had a, a nickel for every person that said it's dangerous to ride a motorcycle, I, I'd be super wealthy right now. Um, I get it. Uh, but the, the biggest issue that I have are all the jerks out there that ride like idiots on the street and the lane split at 70 miles an hour and stuff. You know, you're, you're giving everybody a bad name and it's it's really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Brian says you should uh, convert your drones into battle drones next time. You'll be ready to take them out. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and just, just a quick reminder, you know, yes, one of the selling points of this drone is that it's under the 250 gram re-registration requirement limit, but that in no way exempts you from being able to, to, or to follow the rules. You still can't fly where drones aren't allowed. You still can't fly. And if you're thinking about getting these, one of these, it's, it'd be a great idea to check the Before You Fly app or website that shows you exactly where you are allowed to fly or where you should be cautioned to fly um, to keep that in mind as well. Okay. Um, Steve, you were looking for the perfect camera to capture, you know, kind of just from not as a professional photographer, you were there as, um, as a relative of the bride, um, your daughter's upcoming wedding. Yeah, she gets married in Maui in January, and I have this old uh, Canon G9 point and shoot, and um, I used it for years, and it's kind of sat in a drawer for a number of years. My wife was using it for a long time, but now she's using all my um, my older Canon gear. And, uh, anyway, everything that we have is, is pretty bulky. Even the, the mirrorless that I went to, as many of you know, it's a medium format. So it's small for that realm, but it's still a big camera. And I just don't want to show up at, at, uh, my daughter's wedding as a guest and bring out some big bulky camera. So I would like to just find a really cool street photography point and shoot, which is actually wh whether it's a point and shoot or changeable lens, um, that's to be determined, but I've wanted this for quite a long time. I could just never really justify it. But now I have a good reason to replace the G9 with something more updated. Uh, kind of got my heart set on a couple of cameras, thanks to Brian Scanlon. I've actually been talking to him quite a bit. I'm a big Fuji fan, um, but I've looked at all kinds of things, Ryko and Olympus and Fuji, and even checked out Panasonic, even looked at some Leicas, but I just don't want to spend that kind of money. Um, so I want to know what you have to say about this. And before you start, I know I'm judging a book by its cover here, but that thing looks like it's plastic <laughs> and I'm not buying a, a piece of plastic. Well, for those of you who watched the show last week, I was very excited because my daughter brought this home and, uh, it's a HP 618 2.11 megapixel, uh, photo smart camera. Is that the one you like set on a dock next to your computer and it just syncs everything up for you? It it may have at one time. I, I don't know uh, because it does have this little, it's a paper airplane button on the back that when I press it, it doesn't do anything, but it must have at some time sent. Um, um, 
those of you who who were on the sh or um, you know watched last week, you know that I wasn't successful in getting it to take a picture because I was using a 16 gigabyte CF card. Well, for you fine people, I went and spent twenty dollars. <laughs> I don't. I just, oh, that's why you bought the CF card. Yeah, that thing, that thing takes CF cards. Take CF cards. I went and bought myself a 128 megabyte CF card. And now I can take 237 pictures, baby. Or Steve, you can take 237 pictures. I've got a truckload of CF cards. All my candy gear is still. Uh, um, it, it works very well. I The interesting thing to me about the menu is incredibly simple menu. I know it's kind of hard to see there. Um, but one of the things, one of the really only things that is in the menu that you can do is time lapse. This camera will shoot a time lapse? What? Wow. What? Is you it? had to buy a, an app for the Sony up until a year ago to shoot time lapse, and it's built in. Will it shoot raw? Uh, no, it will not shoot raw. And my G9 is better than that thing. Psh, <laughs> yeah, but come on. Come on, look at this. Look at this little uh, optical viewfinder. Does your G9 have an optical viewfinder? It does, actually. Yeah. Uh, I forgot. Okay. Um, uh, it's got a zoom. And the other thing that I thought was hilarious was if you want to review your pictures, you actually turn the dial to review. You turn it to the review button. And then um, you can find... I was uh, so excited. I thought you had something legit for me. No, I'm sorry. Why would, why would I do that? This channel is not anything useful. So you know, I'm, I'm going um, back to... Uh, forget you, Toby. Brian Scanlon's my new... Uh, Photo rec professional. Yeah, I think we should all rely on Brian. But then, of course, I just point out you're going to end up with three lens mounts in your family there, Steve. Your Hassi, your Canon, and Fuji. Yep. I know. I'm knocking on your door, bro. How many's too many? You went from, I don't know, 17 lens mounts to Sony and Sony. Sony. Um, well, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm really looking at. The Fuji XE3 is probably the front runner right now. Uh, it's got virtually everything that I want except the articulating screen, but it's got a joystick. The XT20 is awesome, except it doesn't have the joystick. Um, and then the XT30 is probably the best overall, but I just don't want to pay the price. So, um, yeah, and yeah. it says EOSR. No, that's that you're talking full frame stuff. I just want. Uh, you know, I like to spend 800 bucks or less with a lens. Yeah. So we'll be tracking this. Can you, can you name which one's in the lead right now? XE3. Yeah. Okay. I want to get the silver XE3 with a silver, uh, either 35 millimeter or 23 millimeter, um, F2 lens. Uh, the 18 to 55 is probably the better choice for just an all around, but it's bulkier. I really want just something small. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I, it's, it's, it's very similar to the, like the X 100 F, but you save a lot of money and I think it's a better looking camera. And then I've got the option to buy different lenses for it. Yeah. So he turned, he turned me on to that one. And that was, that was huge because it, it hadn't even crossed my path. And it's virtually identical to the XT 20. Uh, but it's it's more of the range finder instead of the the standard. Uh, and then the XT series has that kind of plastic uh, built-in flash thing, which I'm not that crazy about. I like this, the look of this camera. It's And it's really nice and small and compact. And... Very nice. Remind, can you remind me, what did Dave McKay take to Vietnam? He got an X100F. Uh -huh, that's that's right. an awesome camera. It's great. Um, I think the lens that's built into that is the 23 millimeter, which is a 35 equivalent uh, F2. Um, I just, I don't, I don't think I want a fixed lens. I'd like to be able to change that out. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It certainly makes it infinitely more, more useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But then, but then you're always kind of looking for the next lens, which yeah. spoiler. Although those Fuji lenses are awesome though. They're not really expensive. No. They're super small. Brian sent me a picture of three prime Fuji lenses uh, sitting together on a table and they're the size of a business all three of them fit on a business envelope. I mean, that's just awesome. That's nice. Yep. I, I, there, there's other things. Sony, you know, as far as bang for the buck, 
they've they've definitely got it. I just I don't want to get lost in that whole menu system. No, no, yeah. Leave that to you. Yeah. Did I tell you this? I don't know if I told you this. We we, we give crap to the Sony menu system. And then I kind of defend it sometimes. I was like, well, you set your camera up in such a way that you don't really need to spend time in the menu. But then in reviewing the A7R4 in Mongolia, Kaz and I sat there for together about five minutes, both of us Sony users for years, looking for a menu option that we knew was in there somewhere, but it took us five minutes to find it. So yes, the Sony menu is that bad sometimes. Speaking of Sony, here is uh, what has just arrived. It's been out for a while, but I haven't shot with it yet. This is the uh, 200 to 600. Wow. Doesn't work. I want it to be balanced nicer. And I'm very excited to see how it compares to the 100 to 400. So you got that from Lens Reynolds? Uh, yes. And um, where are you going with that? Where am I going? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, you know, I wanted to, this has just been on my list for so long that I might just, you know, shoot the cityscape from across the water here and there to do some samples. And then for autofocus, just shoot, um, Archer running back and forth in the park. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have any big trip planned. Four, five to six, three. It is, I don't think it starts at four, five. It starts at five, six, five, six to six, three. And the 100 to 400 is four, five to five, six. Oh, okay. Yeah. And of course, just out of reach, I have the one, four extender as well that both of these work with. Um, um, I'm just interested to see how they compare much more travel friendly, uh, a little bit more wallet friendly. Uh, but man, this is, this is a pretty big beastie lens. But if you were going to like Tanzania or someplace like that, I mean, that's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned. More information coming about that soon. Um, I'll be, I got, I got a lot to do in the next couple of weeks and then it's going to be Thanksgiving all of a sudden, but uh, that's okay. That'll be good. It's all good. I think, let's see, what are we going to talk about? I saw Roy mention it in chat. I have it in my mishmash notes. Some ways I feel kind of bad even talking about it because it really is a rumor of a rumor, but it's a rumor of a rumor going around that uh, Olympus is going to be shutting down its imaging department in 2020. Yeah, I saw that. And um, I mean, like you said, it's a rumor of a rumor. I, I could definitely see that happening. I mean, there's crazy things just happening in the in the corporate climate these days. Um, that's really too bad if that turned out to be true. I hope it's I hope it's not. Yeah, uh, more. I bring it up more for as Chris and I was actually talking about it in the the morning that I read that article. The morning before I read that article, we were talking because we're going to Thailand. We're talking about traveling the light. I asked, it, "Do you want to bring a camera?" Um, and Chris doesn't own a modern camera right now. She's got an Icon D eighty, I think, actually that she gifted to her niece. Um, so she doesn't really have a camera right now. And do you want to bring one to Thailand? And she's like, "Well, I'd really like to bring that Pen F. Olympus has that Pen F." Hey. If, if that was, that was my front runner. I just, I don't want to spend that kind of money. I love I that know. camera though. It's a fantastic little camera, but it just is stuck at that thousand dollar price point. Yeah. Cause it's got a lot of style and it's, it's a very kind of pro level camera, but in this really small compact body. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the micro four thirds, the pen F uses the four thirds also. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's one thing that just, it didn't concern me too much, but when you start to spend that kind of money, spending, you know, a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks for a micro four thirds was just a tough pill to swallow for me. And, um, but I, I really, really like that camera. Um, you yeah. know, and, and when you start stacking up some, some of uh, Fuji's offerings for less money and a bigger sensor and, you know, their reputation and everything, uh, yep. just, I, yeah, I, I know but my issue here is personally i don't want to add another lens mount into the family i have the gh5 suspended above me for tabletop shots sometimes i don't use this camera a ton but i have several lenses for the micro four third system she'd be able to use that i already have those um she's not a big fan of the sony's i don't blame her you know the sony mid-level i've complained about the last couple of models they really need a design redesign they're just not very user friendly for kind of more manual 
thoughtful control and it's how like she likes to shoot so yeah i don't know we'll see yeah we'll see yeah I, I can't get excited i've tried super hard to get excited about some mechanics um you know like the m series and stuff and i just for whatever reason i can't get there uh, i know that i could buy an adapter and i can use my glass and stuff but the whole reason is i, I want to get something that literally just my wife can because she'll use it probably more than i will actually but she can just stick it in her purse or i can you know put it in her coat pocket and take it around um, you start doing adapters and lenses and all that other stuff it just becomes bulky super fast yep yeah okay a couple of more quick points as we start to wrap up uh one is nikon's profits announced not good similar oh, to I canon's that one i didn't read the article i saw the uh, headline though pretty pretty grim let's just say that it's pretty grim um and they were pretty frank and forthcoming in their um kind of uh what do you call that where they they talk about their profit loss uh and said that basically they need to really narrow down what they're um offering really focus on the prosumer consumer or they say the hobbyist and cons prosumer or professional hobbyist and professional so i think um I don't know exactly what they mean by that. I, there was a lot of confusion in the comments too. What what isn't that cover the range of who they are already trying to sell cameras to? But um, you know that kind of lines up with uh, Pam asks us what I what we think about the Nikon Z fifty, uh, their new crop sensor mirrorless. I think it looks nice. Looks great. I think it's a really tough sell uh, right now with an incredibly limited number of lenses um, and just not a whole lot of reason to buy in at that spot other than it it's a pretty good camera at a nice price point mm -hmm. um so i don't know it's going to be really interesting I, I said this about a year ago the next year is going to be really interesting i don't feel like it's changed a whole lot over this past year as far as what's on the market but certainly we're seeing signs of both canon and nikon and even sony's profits have been down not doing very well but sony with that imaging sensors division just kind of props up the whole system pretty nicely so um, some of these guys do with these um, these crop sensor mirrorless that they're coming out with is when it's such a crowded marketplace um, and and I I can brand myself the aesthetics guy but uh, you know you do look at some of these cameras in this crowded marketplace and they've got the the really cool old school style to them and people people like that it's quality materials they're heavy it's metal it's magnesium it's you know whatever. And um, they just, they don't look sleek and cheap or anything like that. Yeah. And I think that that is a big deal. You look at the super controversial, uh, what was it? The Nikon DF that came out a while ago. And it, that was an expensive camera, still is an expensive camera, but it's got this like cult-like following and people just either love it or hate it. And you almost need to do that with these cameras. So many of them are coming out that it's like they're just kind of playing it safe. They're giving you these features and it costs this amount of money and people say, okay, it's another one in the mix. Yeah. And that was something that looks cool and you want to carry around your neck or have in front of you and enjoy the, the whole experience of shooting it. I think you'd sell a lot more of them. Yep. Yep. Uh, and kind of related to that, we have this interesting news that Sigma FP, the world's smallest full frame mirrorless, you've mentioned that you really think that's a pretty interesting camera. Yeah. Um, in Japan, at least, it outsold the Sony and Canon and Nikon mirrorless at two of Japan's major camera stores. And interestingly enough, in one of those stores, it wasn't available until nearly the end of the month. For like the last five days, it was available and it's still outsold everything else that had sold all of the rest of that month. So I'm a little dismissive of it because I think Sigma makes some of the best lenses out there, best value. They haven't really hit the mark on a camera. Um, but but Sigma is a different company than they were two years ago now. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows of Sigma. They know their reputation for great third-party lenses. They have a bunch of different mounting uh, options. And so... Sigma is has a great reputation now for third party lenses and they come out with this camera that uh, the stat sheet is just blowing everything away and the size of the camera is unbelievable and they're marketing it really well. But then the price comes out and it's like a thousand dollars less than everybody thought it was going to be. As soon as that hit, I thought th they'll finally sell a camera now. And I'm glad to see that they're doing that in Japan. I, I can see people picking it up here. Um, 
kind of like what I ended up doing with the Hasselblad medium format, but on a much less expensive scale um, out the gates. You know, the Hasselblad was so expensive and then it came way down. And now the second iteration is out and it's come down even more. But you get this really cool, small uh, camera with a giant sensor inside of it that can perform. And um, I mean, that that thing I think is is awesome. I think technologically, it's kind of the camera that I wish Canon and Nikon and everybody else was was introducing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's 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 definitely unique, and I think it does have a niche. Um, how big that niche will be or will provide for it, um, I think, is very very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I definitely. Maybe this will be the camera I'll take to Thailand. I'll just keep saying that until I just leave for Thailand. That would be an awesome one to take. Um, wow, is it twenty one ninety nine? Twenty one ninety nine with lens. No way, really? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm so not buying something like that anytime soon, but I thought that thing was introduced at like twenty five hundred dollars body only. Here we go, uh, body only eighteen ninety nine. Okay, I was getting my numbers mixed up. That's that's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's Sigma, you know, it doesn't carry the weight of Canon or Nikon or Sony or something like that. But I'm telling you, well, they're proving it in Japan. But I think that I think you get quite a few enthusiasts picking that thing up. I, you know, they're, I don't think Canon, Nikon, and Sony have anything to worry about with Sigma creeping up and taking a bunch of their market share. But I'm just really glad to see a company like that that's made some huge strides in just the reputation of their product and what they're putting out and how quickly they're getting stuff out and the quality of, of it, um, you know, diversifying their product portfolio. Yep. Yeah. I was just curious, here I am on B and H mirrorless system camera, uh, ranked by best sellers. This is usually a pretty good, this is updated nightly in the order that they are selling. Um, and you can see Sony then followed by EOS, no Sigma anywhere on here, but it's not really shipping yet from B and H. So that might be, um, part of that. The SL2 has made it up onto this list though. That, um, if I had the money, man, that would be the camera. It's a pretty camera. Oh, it is a pretty camera. That but thing's awesome. And it shoots that, um, a, the video is quite impressive on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there was one other question I wanted to answer from Kate. She said, how much does that 200 to 600 weigh? Uh, I'm going to get to that in just a second. The one other thing, sometimes we're, I started to drop it off because I don't always want to do it, but photos from space. I was in the Sony A7R, uh, A7R3, A7R4 Facebook group the other day, and this shot caught my eye um, simply because, well, it's, it's a nice full moon shot, tons of detail, right? Look over here. He shot video, 2,000 frames, stacked them, and that is the resulting shot. Now, honestly, I think it's a little crispy, but that, I think, is the future of photography. That's right there. Impressive. Okay. Hey, you know, I went to the uh, Cincinnati Observatory last night. I took my grandson up there. Oh, yeah. I saw your Facebook post. And um, we looked through the oldest uh, telescope west of the Atlantic, and uh, I got to see Saturn last night. There was kind of a break in the clouds. We got to see Saturn and um, got to look very closely at the moon. Very cool. Did it look this crispy? Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Well, it was super bright because we have a full moon right now. So in the center of it, I mean, it was just incredibly bright. So all the the darker spots that you see in there, uh, they all have names. Of course, I don't remember, mm -hmm. them, but um, those were pretty blown out. But if you looked around the edges, you could really see the crispy details of the craters and stuff. It was totally cool. But to me, Saturn was amazing because it was this tiny little thing, you know, way out there. But it was really bright and you could see all the rings around it. And that was the first time I'd ever looked at Saturn live before. Cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Somebody in the comments on that said, or you could have just taken one shot with a decent lens. But I do think this is the future of photography. And this is what, that's what the pixel is doing with its pixel shift. Uh, it's taking a bunch of photos, sandwiching them together in real time. I'm not sure what software this guy used, but I think we're going to see more and more of this kind of computational. If it can happen in camera, that's awesome. Like our phones. Um, once that comes to cameras, I think that's going to be pretty impressive as well. Yeah. And then... Kate just wanted to know how much the 200 to 600 weighs. I brought my scale out here. 
even though Chris asked for me to bring it back up to the kitchen. It's still down here in the basement. It is five pounds, almost exactly five pounds. That's without its lens hood. Uh, yeah, lens hood is light. Uh, the 100 to 400 is three pounds, two ounces. So two oh, pounds difference. You can see that in the size. Yeah. What's the diameter of the front front glass? I think it's a 72. A, 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 ooh, it's no. It's a 95. I was going to say, man, that looks pretty big. Yeah, you're right. That uh, is big. Um, that's another thing that's nice. This is just, I think, a 72, maybe an 82. I don't know. I can't Sorry, remember. 77. What do you think? 77. 77. I bet you're right. Bet you are, Steve. Um, oh, and I need to talk about, uh, this is that 85 from Viltrox uh, that they sent me. Um, it honestly took me a week to get the lens hood off. It was jammed on there. Finally, this morning, I I banged it onto the table. Look, it's not just me. I know I, I look a little weak, but um, I had David Carr try while he was here. And it was so much force that you felt like you should never have to apply that force to anything. How many Manhattans had David Carr had before he tried, though? <laughs> What? I mean, how many Manhattans had David Carr had before he tried? None at all. None at all. Oh, that's the problem. Three Manhattans, he would have been able to knock that off, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll be I'll be shooting with this some more. So far, the focus is seems spot on and and quick and impressive. And the price of this eighty five one eight is uh, pretty nice. So that might be a nice budget alternative for some Sony shooters as well. So obviously, I got lots to do in the next coming weeks. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, if you've watched this much of the show and you haven't already, it would be nice if you hit that thumbs up button. We really appreciate that. And if you're watching and you want to get notified of future videos, well, you should hit that subscribe button along with the little bell to be notified. And you also should let YouTube send you little notifications as well. But the bell at least says starts that whole process. And uh, you should follow Steve on Instagram. That's linked right down below this video. Uh, maybe you'd encourage him to actually post once in like a month. You're, oh, you're gonna be so disappointed. Follow me on Instagram. I'm, I'm, it's like feast or famine on there. I'll go through this 30 day stretch when I really oh. get my life together, <laughs> and then I won't post for like three months. So I'll, I'll put your professional Facebook page under there too. So if because uh, you do post there more yeah, frequently, you skirt photography on Facebook, and if you can like that page, much appreciated. Um, I'm trying to use that a bit more um, for my work, other than my personal page. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, you bet. All right, and chat room, thank you so much for hanging out with us. So uh, we really appreciate it. And everybody watching this after the fact, thank you. And leave a comment. Let us know what you're up to. What piece of gear are you most interested in to hearing more about on the table? You can let us know. All right, everybody, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. See ya. <laughs>